Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Clarice Rosa Sharif. I'm the Senior Director of Literary Programs at PEN America. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this particular event uh, of the 2021 PEN America World Voices Festival. A few notes before we dive in. We are broadcasting on Crowdcast and we encourage you to join the conversation in the chat. Our team will be there answering your questions and sharing information about our participants. So tonight, Fatima Sheikh, Caitlin Greenwich, and Sadir Hartman will be in conversation to recover lost or about how we recover lost and untold stories from the early history of black freedom in America. Fatima Sheikh is the author of Economy Hall, The Hidden History of the Free Black Brotherhood, the story of the New Orleans community from the Haitian Revol Revolution to the creation of jazz. Caitlin Greenwich's uh, latest novel, Liberty, was inspired by the life of one of the first black female doctors in the United States, taking readers from Reconstruction era Brooklyn to Haiti. And finally, Sadia Hartman's most recent book, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, is an exploration of 20th century young black women and was rec recently awarded the 2021 Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for nonfiction at our literary award ceremony just um, a few months ago. Um, so Fatima, Fatima, Caitlin, and Sadia, thank you for being here. Thank and you. how are you? How are you? Happy to be here. Yes. Yeah. Great. Looking, looking forward to the discussion. Yeah. Very happy to be here. Wonderful. And where are you physically in the country? And if you can tell us, you know, even where are you in your house right now? Because this is the nature of things, right? We are not in New York City. We are not in uh, at Cooper Union or at the New School where we typically are during festival week. So where are you? Um, I'll start. I'm in central Massachusetts, about um, a 25 to 35 minute drive to the west of Boston. Um, and I am my my daughter and I came here to quarantine at last March, and we have been here ever since. And um, my sisters and mom live in this house. So I've been actually in my sister's part of the house, which is her lovely book collection behind me. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I'm in New Orleans, uh, in the house I grew up in. So you, you're seeing this behind me. Uh, this is the room uh, that my dad built. So uh, we've kept it in the family. We've kept the house in the family. So I'm down here right now. Wonderful. And Cynthia. Wonderful. So I am back in New York City and I am in the den of my apartment, which doesn't have much sunlight, but has a great connection for to Wi-Fi. So. Wonderful. And I'm in Brooklyn. I actually stayed in Brooklyn the whole time with my family in our apartment. And I have made kind of an office space of the kitchen. It's been working, but I miss having my own office, I have to say. Uh, so we'll be back in the office at Pan America very soon. And I'm looking forward to escaping a little bit the house and you know the the mundane of of what it means the mundanity of what it means to be in the house all the time. So um it, it was such a treat for me to read your work together. Um, even though I knew uh, actually about, you know, your previous work and I know Fatima very well because she's on our Pan America uh, board as well. I really felt it was such um, a unique experience for me to be able to read your work together. I really was swept away in a way that I didn't expect. And they each forced me into deeper reflections about my own story, my relationship to history, to the history of my own family, and to the history of the community that I come from. Uh, and I come from um, Martinique, a Caribbean French island, 
and and so everything you know, I can write about, even the idea of migrating, you know, from one place to the other is, is so familiar to me, but to also my personal family history. And um, it also brought to mind the many books that I've read over the years that reflected back to me who I am as a black person in the world, in the black diaspora, who my people are, who are my parents, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought about Marie Condé. I just have to say her name because she has been uh, the person that I've returned to over the years um, to, 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 to kind of look at myself, right? Of a person of Caribbean ancestry and living in now uh, the United States. Um, so I wanted to start um, by by asking you each to tell me a little bit about the book so that our audience can have a, a, a better understanding. And then why did you write this book and who did you write it for? I thought you wrote the book for me. So I mean, in, in terms of that, that question, I thought it was for me, so, but I want to hear from you. So tell me a little bit about your book. Who, why did you write it and who did you write it for? And let's start with Caitlin. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. um, so my book is called Liberty. Um, it's a novel. It's set during a Reconstruction era, uh, a U.S. It takes place in the U.S. and Haiti. Um, and I wrote the book because I had been working for, or the book sort of came from um, an oral history that I did when I was working for the Weeksville Heritage Center. Um, Weeksville is a museum in central Brooklyn that's dedicated to the history of a free black community that was founded there in 1838. And it was essentially a community founded specifically to create a black political power voting block um, in the borough or, or before Brooklyn even was a borough in that area. Um, and, uh, and so I, one of the, the things of working in that museum was we were trying to interview as many descendants of, of the founders as possible. So we interviewed this woman named Ellen Holly, who was a soap opera actress in the seventies. And she was a descendant of Sylvana Smith, the founder of one of the founders of Weeksville and his daughter, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, who was the first black female doctor in New York state. And um, she came and she gave this oral history and she's, a, she's, an, she's an actress, she's a trained sort of Hollywood actress and um, she had sort of that old black Hollywood voice like the Lena Horne kind of like beautiful, like <laughs> new location, <laughs> master storyteller. So she told this wonderful story where she sort of talked about the doctor and then she said, but the most, the thing that is interesting is, is this daughter that she had, this daughter, Anna, who married the son of the Episcopal Archbishop of Haiti. Um, and uh, the marriage did not go well. The, the marriage appears to have been abusive. And she wrote these letters home to her mother, the doctor saying, um, detailing what was going on and saying, please help me try and figure out a way out of this. And her mother felt tremendous guilt because she'd actually talked her into this marriage. Um, yeah. right before that she was supposed to get married, the, the daughter sort of went to her mother and said, I actually don't think I want to get married to this person. I, I think I was sort of a little bit too hasty in getting engaged. And her mother told her, you have to go through with it. Um, you know, this is going to be a big sort of uh, uh, society wedding. And it even got written up in um, white newspapers. It's like noted in, in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which was very rare for that time period. Um, and so her mother sort of forced her to go through with this marriage. Um, she got married. It was it was really awful, but she did love the um, country of Haiti. She she settled in Port-au-Prince, and she did love living there. She just did not enjoy being married to her husband. So the doctor sort of helped her escape, and and there was a sort of like very dramatic escape story where she got her to the U.S. Embassy in Haiti, and then she sort of had to get onto a carriage and get to a waiting ship, and with her husband's family following her. And according to Ellen Holly, for the rest of her life, this woman would tell stories to her children and grandchildren about how much she loved and missed the country of Haiti, but also for the rest of her life, she was getting these letters um, from her in-laws who were still in Haiti saying, come back here, come back to this marriage. Not only are you letting down our family by doing this, but you are letting down the whole idea of um, black achievement. Um, you know, if you don't come back here, this is a stain on black people in general as a whole race, as, as, as the history of our people. Um, and so Ellen Holly sort of, pointed out, she said, I am just so, I, I think about what it would have taken to make that choice, 
knowing that not only are you personally ending this relationship and personally changing these things for your children, but that that's the narrative that your larger community is telling you about, about that choice. That's not just about you. It's just sort of like it enters you into history in this really um, sort of um, wrong or, or um, you know, uh, uh, you know, awkward way. Um, and uh, Ms. Holly had such sort of um, you know, compassion for the woman who she was talking about and such a keen understanding of that um, trap sort of of uh, Black excellence and Black achievement in sort of the, the story of, um, of uh, African-American history. And I was just so struck by it. And I, I thought to myself, if I ever get a chance to write a novel, I, I want to write it about this. And so I wrote it I mean, I think my ideal reader for it is um, uh, black women throughout the diaspora. It's it's a it's about motherhood. It's about um, uh, sort of self determination for black women and what freedom looks like specifically for black women um, who, especially black women, as they um, inhabit multiple positionalities in a society or in a community. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and Fatima, uh, if you can tell us a little bit about the book and why did you write it and who was it for? Um, well, I wrote this book. This book sort of came to me because uh, my father found 24 journals in the trash, about 3,000 pages of French handwritten journals um, that uh, he brought into the house in the 1950s. I was really small. And he brought them home and uh, just said one of these days he was going to get to them. You know, he, he understood French. My mother spoke French from being in Louisiana. He never did get to them. And by the time I was a journalist and then a fiction writer, I needed a new project. So I went to uh, the closet and looked in the closet and started reading these books. And I found out that this, there were 3,000 pages. There were, I, I found out that this group of people that wrote the books were part of the Société d'Economie et d'Assistance Mutuelle, the Economy Society of Mutual Assistance, right? And they were a group of free black men in New Orleans who began in 1836 and their organization lasted at least until the 1950s. Well, this kind of blew me away that it was that long. Uh, and then uh, when I started to look into the people themselves, I noticed the names of my neighbors, people who I had grown up around. It was a sort of community that they had built and they had really actually helped each other. Uh, their, their goals were to uh, help each other, to educate each other and to put out a hand to protect uh, society, to protect suffering humanity. So they had actually done that over the years. The names that I found when I started looking up the names, so I took the, I went through the books, so it took about five years to just read the French, you know, cause I'm, my French isn't as good as my parents. Uh, and uh, it took that long to read the books. And then I started looking in secondary sources and then primary sources like notorial archives and, and uh, real estate records and things like that. I found out that these fellows were probably some of the most prosperous uh, free blacks in the United States. They, they had friends in Mexico, they had friends in Haiti, they had houses in uh, France and Italy, as well as in New Orleans. So um, some had uh, fought in the Battle of New Orleans. Many of them fought in the Civil War. They were part of the Reconstruction government. So I was, I guess, called in that way because they were in the house. <laughs> I was called to basically tell a story. It was a story of a community I grew up in and sort of how it evolved uh, from this. Um, many of them came from Haiti. Many of them lived in New Orleans. About, I'd say about half and half. Half of them were sort of in colonial Louisiana, and about half of them had come from uh, Saint-Domingue around the time of the revolution or just after. I followed the story of a fellow named Luja Bogil. Um, we say Bogil in New Orleans because I know the family, you know, they're my cousin's cousins. Um, and, uh, but they, uh, his, his father probably fought in the Haitian revolution because some of the, uh, one of the fellows who signed his marriage certificate was Charles Savory, who was in the, in the Haitian revolution that we know about. Um, so, uh, I followed Bogiel's family from the Haitian Revolution to the creation of jazz. Uh, and the creation of jazz happened in Economy Hall. So this Society of Economy, Economy Society, built a hall in 1857. And from that time on, they had concerts, they had balls to support each other, they had all sorts of music. They got very political, they had voter registration long before uh, the 15th Amendment. Uh, they had all sorts of things that, that brought political power to this community. 
So I followed them all the way through to Jaya's because at the time when they became disenfranchised, when white supremacy really got hold down in the South, uh, these fellows went back into their hall, did the same thing they did at the beginning, helped each other, supported each other. When somebody needed to build a house, they helped each other build a house. They, they lent each other money. And that's how this community stayed throughout Jaya's. So um, that, that's the story that I'm telling. And I guess I had to tell it, you know. <laughs> that's great. That's great. I love that. So Dia, what about you? Yes, um, I began um, thinking that I wanted to write a book about photography and African-American practices of self-fashioning as a way of thinking about what freedom meant. Um, but early on, I encountered a photo taken by uh, Thomas Aikens of, uh, of a young Negro girl. The photo was taken in 1882. And that just, you know, raised um, all of these questions like, oh, how did that young girl wind up in the studio? Um, was she accompanied by a mother or guardian? Um, how would a young girl be made a subject of a nude photo? And so I, I was like, okay, I really want to understand this um, period better. And so then I reread Du Bois's Philadelphia Negro. And so it's really the encounter of that Aikens photograph with Du Bois's monograph on, you know, the black community in Philadelphia at that point that, um, you know, started the project. And I think probably in a lot of ways like New Orleans, I mean, Philadelphia was a very, very diverse black community with mm -hmm. you know, educated black elites. And then these kind of, you know, um, rough new arrivals <laughs> that sometimes were welcome and sometimes weren't. And that encounter just helped to me recreate um, the world at the end of the 19th century and to think about black aspirations for freedom, black dreams of, you know, what a life might be like after slavery, what would be possible in the North. And it was a moment where it seemed like everything might still be possible. So I just wanted to capture that sense of openness and possibility, um, and as is the case in New Orleans, and then the enclosure, which um, meant that, you know, Black lives were radically restricted, um, you know, as much in the North um, as in the South, despite um, the absence, in many cases, of laws um, supporting segregation. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm so glad that you, um, you, you, you talked about that, that photograph, because in, um, I want to, I want to then talk about freedom, but before we do, in, in, in Fatima's book, she, she said, she, there was a sentence that, that really struck me and stayed with me. She said, my charge, so Fatima is talking about herself in terms of this project and this book, she says, my charge was to integrate lives with events and documents with ghosts. Mm -hmm. And there's something that really resonated for me uh, when I was thinking about the, the three projects that you guys were, you know, kind of like uh, dealing with separately. And, you know, bringing the individual, um, matching it with events, but kind of also creating, you know, a little more, you know, contour and kind of filling in the gaps. And then this idea of a ghost and, um, you know, the things that we can't see and, and something that is also just like in, in, in black communities, there's this communal with the spirits that happens all the time, whether you believe or not, right? <laughs> uh, it happens whether you want it or not. And so I wanted you to to maybe, like, can you tell me more about, like, was, like, the kind of things that happened that just seemed to happen and you were there at the right time to do it. You were the person to do it. Or some the character were, were characters or the places were speaking to you. If there's anything that comes to mind, uh, I would love to hear. Um, well, I, I, you know, I'm surrounded by ghosts. 
<laughs> um, I can tell you one thing that happened to me that is actually literal. You know, I mean, there was a, there's a woman named Marie Laveau who was known no. to be the Buddha Queen of New Orleans. Okay, well, I know one of her descendants. So I was in the library actually uh, trying to uh, find the looking at the documents that I had and trying to find a letter that one of these people, one of the men in the society had written to his girlfriend and decided to publish in the newspaper because, and he was married. So this was a huge scandal. Mm -hmm. What the journals that I read said was, this is a huge scandal and we can't believe that he did it, right? So I had to go back to the actual newspaper and find out what it was that he did. Anyway, so I found the letter from Pierre Crocker to Heloise uh, Laveau, Oh, well, no, she was a Heloise Glapion, I believe. Anyway, to Heloise, he called her Eucharist. Eucharist, like the Holy Host, right? <laughs> he called her Eucharist. My dear Eucharist. Well, I didn't know who Pierre Crocker was really at the time, and I didn't know who Eucharist was. So I see this woman sitting at the microfilm machine, and she, uh, I say, do you know these people? She says, those are my ancestors. So yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah. this is how they sort of fall into my life, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And Caitlin, um, I mean, we your characters have to to wrestle. I'm thinking about Ben, uh, your character Ben Daisy, mm -hmm. who, who who can't get away from um, from his love, who who's also a ghost and uh, uh, and more. Yeah. Yeah, um, so Ben Daisy is a little bit of what Sadia was sort of talking about, that that conflict between um, in free black communities when newer people would come in. And Ben Daisy um, uh, is somebody that Liberty encounters um, when she's about six or seven years old. And he's a newly, he's, he's an enslaved person. He's just escaped from slavery. He's come to this place. Liberty has only known other free black people or so she thinks so far. That's the only context that she sort of has. And she meets this man who's just come out of the horror of slavery. And um, he is trying to figure out how to make sense of that and how to um, live after that. And the way that he makes sense of it and figuring out how to live is not the way necessarily that Liberty's mother would choose or the people around her in her community would choose. And he's kind of being this disruptive force. And um, one of the things that I sort of, I, I wanted him to be somebody to sort of uh, treble the waters and, and create questions for Liberty around what the, the the version of freedom that she's born into, what that actually is. Um, but I also wanted him to, for for readers, for, for readers to understand sort of where he's coming from and why he's acting out in these sorts of ways. So I created this part of him, um, this woman, Daisy, who he's sort of pining for, um, who he continually sees around him in freedom, who he's comparing all the free black women who he sees, he's comparing them to, to this woman he's made up in his mind, Daisy, who's so much better. Um, and then also just like craft wise, I knew that I wanted to um, talk about uh, voodoo once the book moved to Haiti, but I didn't want to sort of like come up out of nowhere. And I wanted to point to the ways that um, African diaspora religions are in conversation with each other across um, places. So Daisy, the character in the book, shares a lot of traits with Erzule. She, she's doing a lot of the different things that um, is, is connected with that Loa and um, she has sort of the signatories or the signatures of that uh, as Ben Daisy is sort of interacting with her. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. And actually to, to quote from your book, Caitlin, um, when the doctor, Dr. Simpson, the who who you 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 base her character off of the the real person uh, in Brooklyn who was the first black woman doctor in the US. So the doctor is trying to cure. Ben. And there's this, I'll just read just a few lines, um, which speaks to what you just said. Uh, she writes in her journal saying what she's going to try to do in terms of finding a, 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 a solution to his condition. She said, we have in our midst, she said, a group of men and a few, and f and a few women who upon discovering our community and life here in freedom, find their souls still oppressed. Their bodies are here with us in emancipation, but their minds are not free. And I thought it was just really powerful. She was wrestling with her scientific mind to acknowledge that there was something beyond the, the, 
body aches or the the, the body suffering sufferings. Um, Sadia, I think uh, maybe let's let's continue and talk about freedom. And in in a previous interview, you explained that in Wayward Lives, you wanted to think about how ordinary people created and lived their own visions of freedom. And so if you can uh, maybe tell us a little more about that, you know, in terms of like, what what was that vision of freedom and how did you did they define it? Yes, I mean, it's a period that, um, you know, historians of African-American life have described either as like, you know, the Nate Deer or as the decades of disappointment. So <laughs> that's the context. So what does it mean to try to imagine a practice of freedom when um, the world you thought was going to be open for you was in fact decisively closed mm -hmm. and becoming more closed because we know that um, by the end of the 1920s, we have these racialized um, ghetto formations that didn't exist at the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so there was nothing. And, and for me, this is the, the wonder and the miracle of like, you know, just the, the practice of black people in this context. I mean, there's really nothing in your external environment that says you can be free, you should be free, you have a right to exercise freedom, but yet people are wrestling, um, you know, in ways that are small and grand with what a free life might mean. Um, one of the ways many of these young women are wrestling with that question is really by trying not to work as domestics. Mm -hmm. um, even at the end of the 19th century, black women were saying this work has, I mean, literally they said, this work has the taint of slavery. They did not want to do it. And racism forced them out of like every other opportunity, the opportunity that young kind of, you know, white immigrant women had in terms of factories, in terms of retail. So you see people trying to be creative to escape that. Some of the ways that they um, do that um, is, you know, by trying to form like mutual aid societies, like, you know, 10 young women living in one room and just sharing resources so um, they don't have to work. I think a lot of it um, was just about, um, you know, practices of self-care trying to fashion a beautiful life, even if you were a poor, you know, working class girl, right? So it was just like an idea of the self as something more than um, the world expected. Mm -hmm. So um, I think one of the things that I really try to underscore is what um, an acute awareness they had of, um, you know, of the social text and how, um, and how, you know, ver and their virtuosity and trying to escape um, the script that was established for their life. But some of it was, you know, by taking a lover. Some of it was by, um, you know, using the little money you had to buy, you know, a, a, a cut rate dress from the department store and a box of fancy ribbons. But really saying that, you know, those aren't small things. They seem like small things but they're not, they're actually really significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, and I think um, in Fatima, in, in the, the, the main character, if, if I can call, yeah. <laughs> call him that, mm -hmm. Lujo um, uh, Bogil, um, he, I, I love, there's a point, of course, you know, you, tr you trace, you know, the history of um, uh, the economy society chronologically, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's matched with the events, but I also, like, there's some, there's a, a chapter or a portion of that's, um, it's Bogil gets radical. And, and, <laughs> and, and so I want, because I think you got very much attached to, to Bogil as, as a person, an individual that you could kind of follow all of these years. Yeah. Uh, and he had a long life and he was so central to the minutes of the meetings that you're using as the foundation of your work. And I wanted, I, I wanted you to maybe talk about that, like that, 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 
that clash with, you know, they had a privileged position, you know, these men, and they were serving their community, they wanted to give back, but then things got also violent, and they were the, the, the object of that violence, so the violence was directed to them, and they were in danger physically, and then, you know, you talk about how it, it, it radicalized him. Can you tell us a little bit more about, I'm thinking about the mechanics yeah, um, yeah, Institute yeah. Massacre, yeah. Yeah. and and yeah. his his experience of that and how we get a really interesting perspective through his eyes of this, this event. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I, it, it was very interesting to me because yes, I did fall in love with Bogiel in a certain way, you know, I mean, because because of the way he wrote, he wrote beautifully, he used exclamation points when he, when, when he really meant something in the minutes, you know. Um, but he, he started out as a poet. He, he, he was always reciting spontaneous poetry and he quoted himself in the journals, which was wonderful. So, uh, but then he, he became, uh, you know, when they started actually in Economy Hall, a petition was started uh, when Louisiana became a state, uh, you know, when after the 10% solution that Lincoln offered, Louisiana became a state, uh, but it was a state because the rebels were, former rebels were able to vote, the blacks were not. So Bogue went to a convention that, that was, uh, created to rewrite the constitution so black men would have the vote. That was in Mechanics Hall. So Bogiel went and several other members of the economy went to this convention and they were set upon by the police force. Uh, the police were former radicals, the police and many of the firemen, and they just started shooting everyone in the hall. So uh, they tried to massacre everyone. Mm. I found the document uh, that is the, um, the, um, the Congress came to, members of the Congress came down to study the massacre afterwards. So I was able to actually get Bogiel's words, his testimony, and the testimony of other economists that were at the place. And uh, Lucian Kapler was one of them. He brought his son just to see what democracy was like. What was it like to be at a convention when you're talking about the vote? Uh, his son was stabbed several times. His son was shot. He lost an eye. Uh, Kapler said that inside the hall, the floor was slippery with blood. And the way that Bogiel was able to get out of the convention, he said, was that he he uh, ran out of the door and the man in front of him was grabbed and murdered, taken off to be murdered. And he was able to escape because they grabbed the man in front of him. Mm -hmm. So he became very radical after that. He, he got uh, very involved in politics and reconstruction politics and, and, uh, and um, the Freedman School. He was a teacher, too. So he got very involved in the Freedman School, as did his wife. That's amazing, and and please jump in if 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 you have something to say. I um I just thought about still like the, this freedom and how it manifests and how you 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 talk about freedom sometimes in 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 the respective books without it being really spelled out as freedom. And Caitlin, I love this scene um, after actually a really. Um, uh, uh, traumatic um, uh, event. Uh, remind me the the name of when when um, people in Manhattan were these riots. Yes, and and so the women come together to to kind of rescue some people who are coming from Manhattan to Brooklyn, and they kind of just like come together. But then they 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 then decide to organize, right? And then you describe their meetings, and I'll just read a little bit. Um, you said it was hard planning, oftentimes hours of talking with no clear answers, but when the women got going, the whole room began to vibrate. Sometimes it seemed that the white walls themselves flushed when the women raised their voices. How strange it was to sit around them at their feet or in the corner and hear them shout, the same women who all week long told me and the other colored girls in town to speak softly, to keep our heads down and our backs straight, to, to train our eyes to overlook the insults of the world outside of town heaped at our feet. Those women told girls like me to ignore the present day horrors around us, to look only toward the future, toward another place that did not exist yet. And this is um, this is Liberty uh, witnessing this 
you know, this convening of women at work and planning and organizing. And I mean, for me, I read this and actually I stopped and I was like, that's freedom. You know, like they were actors, agents in their own lives. They didn't go and ask anybody. They were just trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do next? And, and so I want to, you three actually to, Tell me a little bit about that power of the people coming together. So in your book, Fatima, it's these men who come together and, and Sadi and Caitlin, the power of women coming together in the room and then doing the work and that freedom of being able to do the work, however you define it. So Sadi, Caitlin, and if, if you have, uh, I would love to hear from you on that point. I mean, I, I... Get, Caitlin, do you want to go first or? No, go ahead. I, yeah, I mean, I think I would say, um, you know, two things. Uh, I think that when I um, am writing, I'm always writing a history of the present. And, um, you know, the question of like, oh, how are we going to be free now? Is this pressing for us as it was for them? And, um, you know, part of the reason with the kind of with a the young wayward folks that I write about, um, unlike people who are going to political conventions, <laughs> um, few recognized uh, the politics of their action. But um, mm -hmm. I do uh, actually describe, um, and, and we have these responses, whether, you know, black people's response to um, the 1900 riot in the Tenderloin, mm -hmm where um, the police are indifferent to, you know, the community, the police are a part of the riot with the white mob and beat right. people up and the black community recognizes, oh, no justice is possible. So we're gonna create our own archive of events. We're gonna interview everyone. We're gonna produce our own story of the riot. So that was one response. And then thinking about these, um, you know, young women who were sentenced to the reformatory, you know, um, you know, egregiously, unjustly, there's, um, there's nothing um, that made their being there, um, you know, necessary besides wanting to control the life of, you know, young black women. And when they riot in the context of the reformatory and they create this noise riot, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's again, it's very interesting because it's not as if uh, they believe that this riot is going to, you know, close the reformatory or bring it to its knees, but the kind of the, the collective articulation of injustice and the way they are rioting for one another, the way they are uh, recognizing their common condition and imagining, um, you know, something better than this, imagining a free state by actually being in a struggle against the carceral condition um, in which they find themselves. So for me, that's always so, um, you know, instructive because it's not as if our collective future now is any more, you know, certain than it has been. And certainly the COVID, you know, pandemic has, you know, revealed the great vulnerability of black and brown communities in the US. And it's also intensified the incredible wealth disparities between the rich and everyone else. So we're coming out of this with the um, with social contradictions are actually so much more intense, so much more pronounced than they have been. So how are we going to get free? It's, you know, it's our question um, at this moment. And sometimes for me, historical, quote unquote, historical work is really just thinking about the present by looking at the way um, other actors and other groups um, have grappled with these questions in their own moment. Yeah, this is perfect. And Caitlin, um, yes, you wanted to say something. I, I invest seeing the power of the mother and daughter relationship and the daughter witnessing her mother in action, but not just her mother, like yeah. the other women. 
Yeah, I would I would just add that um, you know what inspired that scene and I think speaks to both Sadia and Fatima's work is I I did a I wrote an uh, an article on this group called the United Order of Tents, which is a really long standing Black Women's Mutual Aid Society that was founded originally by Black women helping other Black women escape slavery. Still exists to this day, absolutely astonishing, mostly in the South. Um, not very well known because they are a secret society and they want to keep it that way. Um, and but I, I got to go to one of their conventions um, while I was sort of in the very early stages of this book. I went with the artist Simone Lee and Madeline Hunt Ehrlich, um, and there was a meeting that they had. It was a it was a breakfast at like eight a.m. on a Tuesday in this um, Hyatt conference room. It was the same day that the um, Senate was going to vote on whether or not to end Obamacare. And it was a prayer breakfast, and all these women were in there, and and literally is probably the best sermon I've ever heard in my life. One of them, one of them preach about about what we were going to do in this historic moment, and who we were putting our energy towards, and and um, what we would do to move forward in what felt like a really sort of like difficult, scary moment. Um, and the energy in that room was. Is something that I've never really experienced before, and and what, one of the things that's astonishing about that group is that um, it's one of it's a mutual aid society that is um, cross class. So there are women who are working class and women um, professional class women. Um, there's women of multiple faith um, uh, practices. So there are very sort of like straight laced, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, more straight laced faith women and women who are used to catching the Holy Spirit and just sort of falling out anywhere. Um, all practice welcome in that prayer meeting by the way and it, I've never experienced an energy like that in my life before um you know I won't say that they that that energy changed the course of anything but we left that meeting and they were like they're not going to do the vote we were like Obamacare stands. It was, it was, I don't know how that happened it's completely um you know I'm still turning over what that was and so I wanted to really sort of explore that when I when I wrote that scene and that sort of question of um, that I think Sadia, you were sort of speaking to of in our present moment, um, what do we do as we're um, sort of within this present that is so precarious? Yeah, that's that's amazing. Fat Fatima, please. Yeah. And I have two questions. I have two last questions. I, I, I want this to last forever, but I have two more questions after this. Go ahead, Fatima. Well, well this is a question. I hate to say it, <laughs> but, but why do we keep, uh, why is this history hidden? You know, we all know it. It's been lasting. It's been around for a long time. Like my people have been around. They were they were in the government. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. why are we why are we keep relearning this history and why is it hidden? I, I want to know what you guys think. Mm -hmm. I love that question. <laughs> I love that question because I I worked for a long time in Black History museums and um, so spoke with like the general public about Black history often. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a real desire to continually say, like, I didn't know this history. Like, there was almost a desire to be like, I didn't know it. And I think saying that means I don't have to engage with it. And I think saying I didn't know this or I've never heard this before keeps the conversation at continual discovery and not actually let's talk about what was happening in that moment in Mechanics Hall when a riot broke out and people were fighting because that tells a completely different version of democracy in the U.S. than what is told to me in 10th grade AP U.S. history or, or you know, in a graduate level seminar about studying democracy in the U.S. And if I can keep it at the level of, I'm suddenly astounded, I don't have to do the harder work of what is that, how can I integrate all that into how I'm understanding, um, you know, these other bigger questions about U.S. life. Yeah, I mean, I, Fatima, when you were talking, I was also thinking very much about Ed Ball's book, um, which is um, right. because he talks about, um, you know, that massacre at Mechanics Hall, a white Southerner, and is imagining that his great great grandfather is one of the white men who's responsible for the violence that's happening. And I, I think it goes to Caitlin's point. I mean, the reason why we have to keep on learning this is because we're in, um, you know, such denial about the racism that has structured this republic that has been its foundation. And also how, I mean, his point, and we, and we know this is true from every new study about the racialized distribution of wealth, and we know how white people have benefited 
from this. And I think it's radically, um, it's so disenchanting. No, I have everything I have because of my merit, because of my hard work, because right. my grandparents came over at the, white, at, at the right time. But no, you have everything you have because also of this history of structural inequality, redlining, segregation, racist violence, but it is utterly disenchanting of the national myth and um, and of you know Baldwin you know spoke of that like uh, national commitment to white innocence. So we, one tells these stories and then they're uh, repressed and pushed to the side because what they demand is, as Caitlin's you know saying that we revise um, this story of who and what the nation is, and we can also think about the incredible pushback to the 1619 project, right? <laughs> it, it's just like, you know, why? Why? Because it's, again, um, people don't want to actually deal with the, the violence of settler colonialism or racial slavery that made the US what it is and what it remains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and, and, and how, like, whose stories get told right as part of this this american history also like i i i i started by saying Maris Condé's name because i feel like i until i read my first book by Maris Condé, i didn't know there was a black woman who was writing these kinds of stories about me and about my history but not my history as like me, little Clarice in Martinique, she was trying. She was charting the history, you know, from the African Kingdom to to slavery to you know post you know slavery, et cetera, et cetera. And so, who's telling the story? And and I think I'm looking on my screen as you guys, <laughs> because you're telling the story. We get to hear different stories, right? And so I want to know because I don't want to assume that it's easy. And right. so I want to ask as, because um, uh, this would be my last question. Do you feel that you have the freedom to tell the stories that you want to, want to tell? Do you have the space um, from the black community, but also from, you know, like academia or the literary community at large to tell the stories you want to tell freely? as the writer, as the person who is kind of in the driver's seat? Um, that's my question to the three of you. Can I, can I say something about yeah, Maris Conde? I mean, I think I'm so happy that you brought up Marisa's name because I think that whether it's Stegu or Ai Tijuba, um, I think it reminds us of the role of black writers in the diaspora and what a significant role they have played in shaping our historical understanding. Mm -hmm. It's not only that they've yeah. given us literary creations, but the writers have done more than anyone else to actually mm -hmm. help us understand the experience of you know, enslavement, the kind of the grand scope of the black diasporic struggles. So I think that Maurice is an example of how much we have depended upon yeah. our writers to create the kind of the, the knowledge and the consciousness we need to understand our situation. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would I would just add to that too. I think there's so much um, value in studying the ways that um, writers spoke to each other across the diaspora. I know a lot of times I think in, in conversations had around like um, how to promote black literature or make black literature or publish more black literature, that exchange between each other um, is often overlooked. And the focus is on how do we get non-black people to read our work or white people specifically to read and promote our work. And I think lineages like the one that you are pointing to point to a completely, to me, freeing way to think about literature and the work and, and what kind of stories we want to tell and what kind of stories we can have in conversation with each other to make sure that we are all um, asking and getting to sharper and more interesting questions because I think that's where 
the generative work comes comes from when um, these traditions and literary traditions and pieces of history are in conversations with each other instead of doing the work of saying we're important, look at us over here, kind of thing. You know? um, uh, something that I find that literature is doing for us is uh, bringing together a lot of disparate parts of our existence. You know, because when I was doing research, one of the the harder things to do was to read music histories, to read um, Southern histories to read black histories and then try to put that together because they all had, they were all segregated, you know? And I said like, one of the things I really need to do is I need to integrate this into a person, you know, into, into, to an experience because there were all these, um, these very segregated history thematically and ethnically, they were all segregated. And that's really not the way people lived. People lived all together. They experienced each other. They, they worked together or they fought each other, but it all happened at the same time, you know? So, so I think that was a challenge. And I think that's something that literature can't do that other thing, other types of scholarship, uh, literature can do a scholar, other scholarship can't quite do it because of the parameters of the, of the uh, discipline. I agree. That's, that's beautifully said. And, and it's, um, it's, it makes me feel so good. And I hope people watching will feel that same sense of like pure joy that I have right now, uh, validating why it's so good to just get lost in your work, uh, but so many other works. Uh, it, it makes us um, understand, uh, like Sadia said, our present better, mm -hmm. right? And where are we now? And, and, and what do we need to know to deal with the now? So I thank you for the beautiful conversation, the moment that we got to uh, spend together. Uh, it's, um, it's a true honor, as I said at the top, uh, to be in conversation and to hear your thoughts. And I can't wait to read what's next I'm not going to ask you about what's next, but I can't not wait. So um, I want to um, thank you for uh, coming together. I want to thank our audience for joining us at this year's festival. There are so many other events that you can uh, still join us for, and I hope that I'll see you there. Um, and uh, I'll say for now, good night, and thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.